Oh, okay, so they did see it. Hmm. Okay, that's good then. Hmm. Came undone somehow. So that must be because of Aaron, right? Hmm. She's not wrong. Hmm. But it remains to be seen if Aaron is going to do something like that. Uh, this is going to be tough for Gabby to hear, right? Especially from her own older cousin. He's accepted it. Oh, look at this. Tatakai, right? Wow, yeah. Just like Aaron, yep. Oh, man. He's earned this. Let him rest. Let him rest. Let him take this one. Wow, those are some mean-looking fuckers, man. It's a cycle, man. Interesting that Jean is speaking up first. I think he's putting it out there. Mm. Look at that. Steps in immediately after putting that out. I mean, it's beyond genocide. Yeah. Can you live with that? Mmm, right, yeah. Wow, I love that the sound cut out. Just lost in their thoughts. Wow. Wow, that was great. Really effective. Mm, that's interesting. Whoa. Oh. Wow, I'm kind of baffled that it's gone there, the conversation. But I get it from Connie's perspective, I get it. Yeah, he's been there a few times, right? Back to his hometown to see her. And should be remembered that Aaron and Mikasa stepped so out of line to get that. Oh, no. No, it's that guy. Oh, wow. This is just like season one. Oh my god, it's Nile. Wow. Just like season two. Yeah, the trauma. It's probably coming right back to her. But this is it. This is the moment. This the setup is there. This has to be it. Yes, it is. It was a perfect setup for this. But it's Nile though, man, so... Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh, they, they'll cover for her. They'll cover for her. Of course. Come on. Wow, both of them. Both of them. 
<laughs> Immediately bringing attention on themselves, right? Unreal, beautiful. Wow. Look how the children are in the middle, protected by the adults. Because you did it too? Ah, I love how Niccolo's in the middle there. Framed in the middle. Acceptance. Though this happened a few episodes ago. Mm. Everyone has a capacity, right? Wow. Yeah. Accept it and then Ah, escape the forest. Mr. Browse, man. The impact he's had. Oh, whoa. Oh my god, barricades. Who's this? It is. <laughs> Let's go, man. Legend. Didn't give up on the cadets. They beat him up, man. They beat him to a pulp. Oh my god, barricades. This is... Transportive, to say the least. Let's go, Sean! Jean Boy! Oh, it's like the elevator from season one. Whoa! Let's go, Jean! <laughs> Only one missing now is Historia. <laughs> Season 2 finale? Oh my god. Speaking of legends, man, Pixis. Yeah. Rest easy, man. Rest easy. Legend. Legend of parody. <laughs> Kichiotis, man. <laughs> Luis. This is unreal. Oh, careful, my Luis. Wow. Can't believe this just happened. Can't believe this scene exists. This is for us. This is for the fans right here. The nostalgia, though. Oh, what a shot. Look at that imagery, though, man. Yelena is still shook. <laughs> Mm. That's right. Man, Jean, what a moment. Sorry, I should, I should calm down now. Look at this. Someone else is carrying him in like he carried Commander Smith. That's oh, gonna be a problem. Hmm. Don't think Yelena's down for this, is she? Whoa. 
Look at Kaya by her side, real close. I don't think Connie's gonna do anything. Like, I don't think that's actually gonna play out, but you can understand from Connie's perspective. Yeah. I think Sasha even brought it up one time. Season 1 finale track again. Annie and Ar uh, Aaron's fight. Ah, that's why they're playing the... Oh my god, I knew there, there must be a reason for it. Enter Annie. Wow. Oh my goodness. Ah. Uh, wow, I've got to say, that was... Yeah, that was actually a great episode. And it was enjoyable, but a different type of enjoyable. That was a fulfilling episode. Wow. Yeah. So many good moments. So many great moments. Okay, how about that? How about that? That is... I mean, <laughs> that is some cliffhanger right there, man. Um, you know, let's let's stick to that. Let's let's stick to the ending first. Uh, Annie, uh, I mean, this is a character that's that's basically been out for years at this point in real time uh, as well, right? A uh, long, long time ago, season one finale, season one, episode twenty-five. Uh, wow, wow, that's insane. That's insane. Now, you know, a lot of questions, of course, a lot of questions, uh, you know, but before I go any further, how crazy is it that the last time she saw Aaron or the last thing she saw was a berserk Aaron saying things like, I'll destroy the world, right? I'll, I'll destroy it all. Now that she's out of that enclosure, that is exactly the thing she's about to see, right? Uh, this apocalyptic situation or scenario, the stampede of the Titans that Aaron Yeager has set into motion. So how about that, right? For her... Uh, <laughs> the progression is just, you know, she hears that, she goes into the closure, uh, the crystal enclosure, comes out years later, and that is exactly how things are playing out. Aaron Yeager has set it into motion, right? Uh, this genocide. Now, you know, uh, during the reaction, I mentioned that, you know, it's actually beyond genocide. And I, I think it is. I feel like it is beyond just genocide, right? Uh, and again, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish the term genocide. That in itself is just um, uh, horrific, right? But I think, I think the the things he set into motion here are uh, even larger than that. You know, to me, it actually feels a bit more like an extinction, right? Uh, you know, you could maybe even put it into the same category as the dinosaurs, right? Uh, like a major event in that sense. Um, because, you know, it's not just, it's not just the fact that all of humanity is being targeted outside of parody, you know, think of the, the ecological damage this is going to cause, you know, it's going to cause immense, uh, damage, uh, you know, irreversible damage to the ecosystem, right? But there's all sorts of other life forms out there. You know, I doubt there's any sort of nuance in the movements of these colossal titans. Yes, you know, it appears that he might be controlling them uh, within Paradis, you know, to kind of limit the damage that might be caused, uh, the collateral damage. Uh, though there has been some already. Um, but outside, I think outside, it's just as simple as stomp, right? <laughs> just smash. Stomp everything that you see. Uh, you know, into a plain uh, terrain, essentially. You know, again, kind of almost going to that notion or the full circle of the beginning of the series or the story, you know, that there isn't any life outside of the walls. But also in that sense, you know, is is it even possible for Parody to survive as the last remaining, uh, you know, people on the planet? Think of all of the natural resources on the planet that are going to be destroyed because of the Stampede of the Titans, um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of connotations. So if this was actually carried out to its completion, 
if Aaron actually sees this through, yeah, you know, there's no guarantee that uh, the people left on Perry D um, might not, you know, run into a lot of big problems um, because of the, the insane amount of damage, the incomprehensible amount of damage um, that the, the Colossal Titans are about to cause to the planet, right, to the terrain. You know, anytime I kind of speak of the Stampede of the Titans uh, and the rumbling and it kind of almost circling back to the beginning of the series, that actually, yeah, there is nothing left outside of Parody. Uh, and this is the last of humanity, uh, the last humans or Eldians essentially on the planet. You know, the possibility is always there, right, of that type of ending. Uh, I think it's a slim possibility because I don't think it's going to go down that route. Um, and, you know, you could tell, you could tell already uh, in this episode that, yes, they're, the people, you know, that Aaron is doing this for, they are realizing that, okay, this is a step too far, right? Um, that they are going to step in, uh, you know, they are going to try to stop this. I think the early stages of that are already being kind of uh, set up in this episode through these characters. Um, so of course, you know, this episode kind of took a major shift from um, these past three episodes, right? Um, a lot of revelations, a lot of jaw-dropping revelations and moments and mind-blowing uh, moments, uh, you know, backstories for God-tier entities, uh, you know, people like uh, Ymir Fritz, the founder, uh, to then shifting to the people, right? The people on the ground, the people that have to deal with this and make sense of this, and the people that might be here long after Aaron Yeager puts this into motion and potentially dies in the process as well, right? And maybe potentially kind of puts an end to the Titans, right? But let me circle back to Annie. Uh, there's lots to get into, but you know, I don't want to lose focus of the cliffhanger ending here because this is a massive moment in the series. You know, it's been set up for years at this point and you know, you don't, this is a rare moment. You don't see this often in stories to have a character. Uh, I mean, maybe not the main, not one of the main characters, but a significant character, uh, kind of just take a backseat for years in the story, right? In real time as well. Um, you know, season one, episode 25 was a long time ago, right? Now here you have season four, uh, part two, the, f you know, the final season, Annie has finally come out of the, the enclosure, right? Again, not by choice, uh, you know, Aaron's hardening or undoing of the hardening kind of put it into motion. So, you know, that whole notion of maybe the jaw titan being the one to, uh, slice it open, that's kind of debunked. Yeah, so you know, all that time ago, she kind of initiated the hardening to protect herself from Aaron. Now all this time later, Aaron uh, is kind of undoing that hardening, right? <laughs> so in terms of Annie and her position in the story at this point, wow, I mean, how do you even begin? Like, first of all, you know, they kind of have to tackle the whole idea or the question of, is she completely clueless at this point in time and she needs to be filled in, right? They've shown me through Lara Tiber that yes, even in the crystal enclosure, she was able to kind of, you know, uh, she was cognizant of the things that are going around her. Though, of course, that's Lara Tiber, right? The holder of uh, the Warhammer Titan. This is Annie, right? And they've shown me scenes of her legitimately being in a comatose state, right? Uh, within the, the confines of uh, the crystal enclosure. So maybe some of the things Armin was mentioning might have gone through to her right? Remains to be seen. Let's see. Uh, again, a fantastic cliffhanger uh, for the next episode. Surely, you know, it's going to focus on Annie uh, kind of trying her best to integrate back into uh, the story somehow, right? It's a tall order uh, because, you know, there is just so much that she doesn't know, right? Uh, there's just going to be so much shock Right, finding out that Bertolt's dead, finding out that Aaron Yeager has set the Stampede of the Titans into motion, finding out that Armin is now the Colossal Titan, uh, just so much, right? So much uh, needs to go down here. So, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in how this is tackled, right? How they bring her up to speed and, you know, her next step. And of course, Armin knows that that possibility is there, that maybe even Annie's hardening has been undone. So, you know, there's that setup there as well. Uh, that Armin himself, uh, you know, maybe accompanied by a few others, could go there uh, to retrieve Annie. Though, let's see, you know, uh, I wasn't given much else other than her coming out of the, the crystal enclosure. If this is Annie right after she goes into the crystal from uh, season one finale, 
then, you know, as of this point, after she comes to, right, after she kind of gets her bearings together, at this point, her first thought is going to be that I'm behind enemy lines, right? So let's see how she tackles that, if that is how she thinks, right, once she comes to. So, yeah, it's an exciting prospect uh, to have any comeback this late in the game. Um, now, you know, in terms of taking a guess, in, uh, you know, in terms of the direction her character might take, you know, they've already set up that there there is a beginnings of, um, you know, that whole notion that a lot of people have to come together now to take on the final boss, essentially, right? They, they had that set up in part one of season four as well. Uh, now it's starting to go towards that, right? All the pieces are here. All the players are here, right? On pair D. And of course, in the beginning of the episode, they showed me Annie's father once again, right? Uh, I mean, there was a focus on uh, Annie's father and some of the, you know, uh, subjects of Ymir in Liberio, right? In Marley. So, you know, it was certainly interested in getting that perspective, right? That they now know uh, that the end is near. The end is near. So yeah, you know, the potential of uh, a lot of these characters from a lot of different backgrounds coming together, right, to fight a common cause or against a common foe. Uh, I mean, it's exciting. It is exciting. Uh, even though, you know, it's against Aaron, you know, um, it is exciting nonetheless to see them kind of potentially come together for something like that, right, to take out Aaron, the final boss. You know, I've been calling calling him the final boss for, uh, for a couple episodes now. But, you know, speaking of uh, motives... Um, and intentions, right, and taking sides, you know, going back to Annie from season one, you know, I, I, f I clearly remember her being the one that was the most um, interesting in terms of her motives uh, behind all of this, right, or her motives into, or her motives for doing this, um, because that still remains to be a bit of a question mark, you know, they didn't give me a definitive backstory for Annie, right, you know, but speaking of characters, uh, potentially coming together to fight uh, a common foe, um, you know, it kind of takes me back to season one, um, again, you know, uh, one of the goodbyes in this episode was to the, to the legendary Pixis, uh, and, you know, I consider him a legend, he is a legend of parody, on parody, right, he made so many things possible. You know, he's one of the reasons Aaron is still alive right now. I mean, of course, Aaron ends up <laughs> taking this path or going down this path. But still, in the early days, he was crucial, right? He was inquisitive enough. He was intelligent enough to listen to Armin, to listen to Aaron, or, you know, entertain the notion or the concept of this potentially being something that could be utilized uh, as a positive, right? Uh, for parody. So, you know, again, uh, a goodbye to an icon of the of the show, essentially, uh, Commander Pixis. So, of course, you know, it was a sad moment. It was a heartbreaking moment. Uh, and it was also goodbye to Niall. So it's kind of crazy that even back then, in the first half of season one, early days, there was this notion uh, or foreshadowing that, or the question uh, that, you know, could, could humanity uh, ever kind of unite uh, to, you know, defeat a common foe? a foe so mighty that it requires everyone to come together, put their differences aside. Again, you know, I can't remember the exact thing he said, but I do remember Aaron also kind of replying to that and, you know, saying something like, oh, the notion of that is naive. But yeah, you know, I'm going to have to go look that up. Uh, but I remember there was something like that in early season one. Uh, so it's kind of insane, you know, the setup uh, all the way back then, um, or the foreshadowing. So yeah, of course, Annie's reintroduction into the story is certainly exciting, certainly exciting. Um, but you know, ultimately, I don't know how much of a role she'll really end up playing. Uh, at most, I think, you know, she might end up becoming part of a collective, right? Uh, this, this, this idea of, uh, a lot of people uniting to, again, taking down a common foe. I think all the, I think all the makings of that are there now, right? Uh, and you see that, you know, after those three episodes, uh, incredible episodes, you see the focus has shifted to the people who have to kind of make sense of this and make the ultimate choices now, right? To, to come to some kind of agreement, to come to some kind of understanding of the situation and how to proceed from this point on um, and how to tackle the situation from this point on. Uh, right, because these are the people that might be here or might have a might have a chance of being here long after 
uh, you know, this thing that Aaron Yeager has set into motion, right? Regardless of him, uh, you know, dying or not, or it being the end of the Titans, though I am quite confident that by the end of this series, this sh it probably is going to be the end of the Titans, right? Uh, that's one of the major things, stumbling blocks. Um, so I do think the end of the Titans is probably a bit of a lock uh, in terms of a guess uh, or potential endgame theories. But, you know, these are the people that have to deal with the aftermath, or at least some of them, right? Because, yeah, it's not a given that everyone's going to survive this. I do expect some major death um, at some point, um, you know, in this endgame, essentially. Now, you know, in terms of Annie being stuck in that crystal enclosure all this time for the all these years, I'm not really even sure if she's aged at all, right? I'm not sure. I don't know the ins and outs of that just yet. Um, I guess I'll find out soon enough, but yeah. You know, it'll be interesting to see if she's much younger than everyone else. You know, they've kind of grown up and she was kind of kind of frozen in a moment in time, uh, essentially. So it'll be interesting to see that. Now, speaking of the episode itself, wow. I mean, that was that was just really fantastic, wasn't it? Um, you know, I was expecting something a bit laid back. And, you know, in comparison to... Uh, these past few episodes, yes, you know, it might be laid back, but some of the things that are playing out in this episode are just phenomenal, right? Uh, key moments of the story, um, crucial moments as well, you know, in terms of character development and growth. And, you know, it's kind of like a goldmine for narrative payoffs. Now, as many of you know, I certainly enjoy uh, the supporting cast. I certainly gravitate towards uh, the supporting cast. And, you know, that's been a thing since season two. Uh, those episodes from season two really, really, you know, kind of established my love for a lot of the supporting cast. And of course, you know, I think some of those episodes from season two are some of the strongest episodes of the series. So yeah, you know, in that sense, this this was certainly right up my alley. I mean, there are just so many delightful and goosebump inducing uh, nostalgic moments throughout this episode, uh, be it through the score, uh, barricades, the moment that starts kicking in. I knew something special was about to happen here, man. Um, it caught me. It really caught me by surprise to hear that kicking in. And, you know, so many other fantastic callbacks here. So many fantastic parallels here. Uh, again, you know, it kind of felt like it's returning to the roots. Um, and it really felt like this one is for the fans, right? Um, kind of like a trip down memory lane. Kind of taking us back to season one. Taking us back to season two right? To a different time in the series and the story. I thought it was beautifully animated. It was certainly noticeable, uh, the animation. Um, there's some stunning frames in this episode as well, right? Again, kind of going back to that imagery of this apocalyptic scenario that's kind of taking place at the moment. I think it has some fantastic emotional breakthroughs, uh, cathartic moments, uh, a handful of them actually. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of fantastic narrative payoff uh play out plays out in this episode right um so yeah you know in, in that sense it, it certainly didn't um even though it was a totally different type of episode in comparison to the last episode uh and the ones that kind of came before that I, I felt that it was just as important and you know i mentioned cathartic moments uh you know be it um that fantastic that phenomenal character arc coming to its conclusion essentially right uh, and I, again, you know, Gabby's character arc kind of revolves around that family, the Browse family. I'll get into that. Of course, the cathartic moments that came from that, the cathartic and emotional breakthrough of Jean kind of taking up that leadership spot that he was always meant to take up, that he was always built for, right? And all that time ago, Marco was the one who saw that in him. So, you know, Marco must be so proud of him in that sense. You know, so to see Jean, one of my absolute favorite characters of the series, you know, kind of grow into this individual, um, it really was such a fulfilling moment. And you see those leadership qualities um, kind of play out in the beginning on the rooftop as well, right? As he's the one who starts to initiate that conversation, uh, the tough conversation, right? Tackling the issue at hand. And, you know, he continues to be the individual who really has a grasp on Aaron's motivations, right? He understands that Aaron, Aaron is doing this for them, the people he cares for most, right? Um, you see that he's always been paying attention to these things Aaron's been saying. Uh, if you go back to part one, he's the one kind of picking up on all of this. But to see Jean in this position, to see the, the person he's become, 
right? It is just so phenomenal. I love it. I absolutely love this character arc. I love the character growth. Um, though, you know, this isn't sudden or anything. I, I've been seeing gradual signs of this. And now Jean is truly, truly, you know, in that position as leader, right? As someone who is, you know, open to that idea, to that notion, right? There's a fantastic scene of him guiding all of the scouts, you know, giving directions, um, taking it by, you know, taking the situation by the scruff of the neck. As one of my favorite characters, you know, there's not much else I could have asked for from Jean's character development, man. Uh, again, now the next phase is kind of being put into motion, right? He's the one kind of uh, tackling the the difficult issue at hand, right? He's the one who, who is kind of speaking up and putting it out there and trying to get feedback from the rest, right? Uh, and you see... Uh, that the moment he gets some kind of feedback, the moment he gets uh, Armin's take on it, you know, he, he then puts in the next point, right? So do we stop him now, right? Uh, he's the one putting that out there. And then, of course, there is Keith Shadis. Wow, wow. You know, that, you know, the Keith Shadis moment uh, in this episode, this has to be one of my favorite moments of the entire series, right? I mean, wow. Wow. Uh, you know, it was a combination of Keith Shadis and Barricades and Jean taking control and just all of that, all of that, you know, almost kind of transporting me to those really incredible moments uh, in, you know, season one and season two, the season two finale, right? Um, it brought me to tears, man. It really, it really had an effect on me. It moved me. And I'm sure so many of you had a similar reaction to seeing Keith Shadis front and center, right? Taking center stage. Um, you know, he's out here, no bruised ego. He didn't give up on these cadets, uh, even though, you know, they beat him to a pulp. And again, you know, you go back to season four, part one, and you see they were kind of almost forced into beating up uh, Keith Shadis. And you see that he still protected them, right? You go back to early stages of this uh, season or part two of season four, as Connie comes into the, the jail cell, you see that even then, right, he protected them. Uh, I, bought, I fought a bear, <laughs> right? You know, these cadets joined up with Flock and his Jaegerist uh, group. Yet, you know, here they are. Uh, Flock is nowhere to be seen. But you see that Keith Shadis is the one who didn't uh, give up on them, right? I, I just love it. I love that. You know, speaking of uh, that incident that happens as Flock came in and kind of forces these cadets to beat up Keith Shadis in uh, part one of season four, you know, the point that Flock was trying to make back then uh, is that, you know, this is uh, just outdated. The things that this individual um, is teaching are just outdated, antiquated, and that there's no space for some of these old timers uh, and their way of thinking, right? You come to this episode, you see all the things that he was teaching them, you know, uh, fighting against the Titans and the ODM gear. Um, it is still relevant. And, you know, I mentioned... Um, uh, Pixis earlier and called him a legend of parody you know shot Keith kind of falls into the same category right I mentioned during the reaction he's a legend on parody but yeah you know characters like Pixis and Keith have been this guiding beacon for the next generation and you know they've done their part in you know uh, equipping them and educating them uh, for the things to come right they've done their best um so yeah, you know, for Pixis, it's a goodbye uh, to a legend of parody. And, you know, Keith is still around, man. Last, one of the last of his kinds, right? Uh, Keith Shadis, he's still around. He's still doing his part. He's still being a guide uh, to the next generation. And you see that baton being kind of passed. You know, as I mentioned, uh, Jean kind of taking up that leadership role. So, you know, once upon a time, Jean was a student of Keith Shadis as well. Uh, and, you know, you see that he's still... He's still out here, still guiding some of these youngsters, some of these cadets. Um, so yeah, you know, I thought it was an incredible moment to see Keith Shadis out here. Certainly not a bystander. No, sir, you are not a bystander. Uh, you are a crucial component of um, uh, the system that has been uh, guiding youngsters uh, and cadets and trainees all this time. But it was absolutely exhilarating to see Keith Shadis show up in that moment. Again, you know, it was really similar to season one as at that point in time, I believe Jean was in there too, right? And he sees uh, Aaron Titan back then, the Shingeki no Kyojin. At this point, they didn't know it was Aaron. He sees him kind of punch that one Titan, right? It's a slow motion shot. Um, but yeah, really similar setup. 
And, you know, that moment of Keith coming in also kind of uh, parallels uh, Hatred coming in, Levi Hatred coming in, right? In season one, early season one, uh, coming to the rescue. Um, so, yeah, you know, I love the callbacks in this episode. Um, you know, that's why I keep saying this is for the fans, right? Going back to the roots. Uh, and it certainly had that transportive quality for that reason, because it does take you back to a special time in the series. And, you know, speaking of callbacks, how about that rooftop scene, right? Um, the debate that is going on. Uh, how should Falco be utilized? I mean, first of all, as you saw through my reaction, I was kind of baffled that they're actually even going there. You know, I thought maybe, you know, they're not even going to entertain the idea. But again, especially given the fact that it's Falco, he's a child, right? So it caught me off guard. It really caught me off guard that Jean is suggesting that they could potentially feed him to Pixis. I mean, yes, Jean is thinking of that chain of command that they need someone uh, like Pixis, an old head, an experienced person, an experienced individual that could uh, maybe, you know, be of use to them. Though, you know, Jean essentially took up that spot, didn't he? Jean took up that role in this episode. Uh, and of course, you know, that moment is one of the best moments of the series for me. Him kind of, you know, slotting into that role he was always meant to slot into, right? That he was always built for. Uh, again, all that time ago, Marco saw that in him, right? Even if Jean didn't see it. Then of course, you know, there's that friction because Connie thinks it should go to his mother, right? They should feed Falco to his mother, um, now listen, folks, uh, can you really blame Connie here, right? You know, given the situation and given the things Connie's gone through, right? He's just in that state of mind at the moment. And, you know, it is sad. It is incredibly sad to see Connie, the goof, our lovable goof Connie, um, going through this, right? Uh, he's a changed individual, you know, after some of these losses he's had, you know, losing uh, that half of himself uh, in Sasha, essentially. Uh, then you know, being betrayed and uh, kind of having these, you know, moments, uh, you know, br breaking down essentially. Um, yeah, you know, this is not the same Connie I remember. So it is heartbreaking in that sense to see him kind of going through this phase. Uh, and now, yeah, he's kind of kidnapped Falco, right? If you could say that. Uh, and he's heading back to his hometown to feed Falco to his mom. Um, now again, like I mentioned, I don't think that's going to go down. It just doesn't really make much sense for that to happen given how they've established Falco and they've given him, um, you know, the, the jaw titan. And it's just not, it's just not like Connie, right? Yes, he, right now he does have the intentions of doing it, but I do think he is going to, you know, come to at some point. He is going to realize, okay, this is not the right thing to be doing at this point. You know, he is going to think about some of the things Armin mentioned here. And, you know, you see that Armin is the one who had to kind of step in or did step in and say, okay, uh, Jean and Connie, listen up, man. Like, this is a slippery slope. But then, of course, Connie kind of claps back, doesn't he? Uh, you know, you came back through Bertolt, through eating Bertolt. And of course, that's a callback to the rooftop scene from Midnight Sun. So yeah, it's certainly an interesting new direction um, or tangent, you know, having Connie kind of be this, um, you know, lone wolf now, right? Going towards his hometown. Um, so yeah, let's see how that plays out, uh, how much focus I might get on that uh, storyline. Hypothetically speaking, say Connie brings her back. He, he does end up feeding Falco to his mother. She comes back. She's coming back into hell, right? Uh, 13 more years of this, right? And then having to know that a child had to be fed to her to, you know, bring her back into this, you know, hellish uh, situation that is the Stampede of the Titans. Um, you know, surely at some point, Connie is going to think about these kind of things, right? Um that, you know, maybe his mother might be so disappointed that he ended up feeding a child uh, to her or he took a child's life for hers, right? So yeah, you know, a lot of things to think about. And I think, uh, you know, I, I do think Connie is going to understand that at some point. He is going to drop this idea at some point. But, you know, I do hope, I, I really do hope it doesn't have some kind of effect on Connie that he feels the need to, you know, kind of atone for this uh, moment of madness maybe, right? Uh, again, from one angle, it is understandable. You can understand Connie's perspective on this. Um, I'm sure a lot of people might, you know, say Connie's being really selfish. He's being really um, just um, irrational at the moment. 
Um, but yeah, you know, that's the situation. That's Those are the things he's been through and it's brought him to this point, right? That he is irrational, that he might be selfish at this point in time, but it is also understandable in his position. You know, seeing his mother like that for four years, as they mentioned, that is just incomprehensible. That is unthinkable to see your mother in that state for, you know, four years. Wow. Wow. So, you know, that certainly has an effect on you, doesn't it? And it certainly had an effect on Connie. And, you know, there's this glimmer of hope, this glimmer of light that maybe, just maybe he could return his mother back to normal, right? So I get it. I get, I get that Connie feels that he needs to do this. Um, but I don't think he'll go through with it. Uh, you know, essentially, I think, I think in the grand scheme of things, uh, in the end game of this, if there is that notion uh, of no more Titans, he might get his mother back anyways, right? If, you know, she does turn back to a human. You know, in that sense, she might be, or actually she is the last pure Titan, right? Um, yeah, I think so. I think so because, you know, Jean uh, confirmed to Anya Capone that yeah, this is the they've taken care of all the the titans, the pure titans, Zeke's uh, abnormal pure titans. So yeah, that leaves Connie's mother as the last remaining pure titan. And you know, speaking of uh, that Jean and Anya Capone scene, that was a really fantastic scene in itself. And you know, I must apologize because I ended up you know some of that hype from the other scenes, right? The barricade scene and Jean kind of taking up that leadership role he was always meant for that kind of carried into that, right? It was still lingering in my mind. So, you know, I had to catch myself a bit because that that is an important moment. You know, it's a heartbreaking moment for Anya Capone to come to the realization, okay, he might not ever see any of his family again. He might not ever see his people again, that his entire country, his nation is going to be destroyed, right? And beyond that, humanity is going to be destroyed, right? So it's a poignant moment. And then of course there's Yelena, right? Uh, who is certainly quite rattled at the moment. She doesn't really even know how to proceed from this point on. Um, you know, she's not even able to comprehend the situation, right? She's not even sure uh, the things that are happening for Zeke or if Zeke is still around anymore, right? Because he's not really controlling uh, his abnormal titans. And in that sense, you know, there was that question, you know, how come Aaron isn't controlling these abnormal titans? Can he control them given the fact that, that they are Zeke's titans? Maybe there was a bit of, you know, him kind of letting them out there because he knew that his friends are more than capable enough to handle these titans and maybe he'll give, maybe he'll, maybe it's going to slow his friends down a bit, right? Um, so he can actually get some, some of the stampede going, essentially. Uh, but yeah, you know, Yelena, let's see how that plays out. Almost doesn't even feel like a threat anymore, does she? Uh, I don't know, man. She's broken. At the moment, she's broken. And you see that Flock has, uh, initiated the process of detaining her and the, the volunteers, right? And, you know, speaking of Flock, yeah, they're, you know, it's going to be a problem because Flock is all for this, right? He's all for this. Uh, you know, the restoration of Eldia has commenced. So he's happy about this. So of course, there's going to be that friction, right? Flock and the Jaegerists and Jean and everyone else, right? So yeah, you know, at some point they are going to butt heads. But yeah, Flock is still around. Uh, and I've, I must say, you know, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. You know, I've established uh, for some time now that his perspective is needed. You know, I mean, it's clear that Flock doesn't have too many redeeming qualities about him, but his resilience, you know, I think his resilience has to be respected, right? Uh, his growth has to be respected, I think. Uh, yeah, he's not a likable individual. I know, I know that, right? I can't say I like his personality, but I can appreciate his, his growth. I can appreciate his journey, right? I can appreciate his perspective. Right. Uh, so, yeah, you know, it's it's still an interesting perspective or angle to have in the story, that friction that might happen now. And, you know, speaking of the Stampede of the Titans and this final action Aaron Yeager has taken, um, you know, the tragic thing here is that now that he's kind of started it, he has to see it through right on a large scale um, because, you know, there's the, there's always that notion that. People are not going to forget this. People are just not going to forget this. Say, you know, even that notion I brought up of these people from Paradis uh, kind of teaming up to potentially take him down and then, you know, people noticing that, right? Ultimately, this is not something people are going to forget, 
And again, this is assuming that they do somehow take him down at some point and there are enough people alive, right? Uh, because, you know, first of all, yes, there's going to be death. There is going to be death um, through the stampede of the Titans. But, you know, if they are to take him down, there's still going to be people left uh, on the planet. And that's the really tragic thing here. They are not going to forget this. You know, it's just human nature. You are not going to forget something like this. Yes, there's that notion that it is just this one individual, the devil of Paradis, who set this into motion, right? And he, that he's to blame, not some of these other people that potentially might help take him down. But no, you know, it's human nature. Uh, someone somewhere is going to have that uh, inclination to retaliate. They are going to have that anger. They are going to have that hate right, to retaliate at some point. You know, so in that sense, I think now that this has been set into motion, at some point, right, at some point, retaliation is inevitable. It just is. Uh, you know, it's just that tragic nature. Uh, it's human nature, right, that cycle of retaliation. So let's break it down, right? Uh, the final boss on one end and his Stampede of the Titans and everyone else on the other side, right? Uh, let's break it down. So they have a bunch of Titans. They have a bunch of Titan shifters. You know, they've got uh, the, I mean, the Jaw Titans kind of out of commission at the moment. You know, there's a bit of a different storyline going on there. But once it's all said and done, uh, maybe, you know, uh, Falco can help as the Jaw Titan, right? Um, but, you know, some of the other Titans they have, they do have Armin and the Colossal Titan. Though, you know, he hasn't used it. He hasn't used it much. Um... Uh, but I feel like he's going to have to use it at some point. You know, now that the, the Stampede of the Titans is um, initiated, you know, they potentially have the Armored Titan, though Reiner at the moment is certainly out of commission and he is taking a really uh, much needed nap, uh, much needed rest. Uh, you know, he's given everything to this conflict uh, right till the end and now he has nothing left. He just needs to rest. Uh, man, Reiner... <laughs> Uh, again, it reminds me of him, you know, back in Liberio in that bed. Uh, yeah, he really needs this. And, you know, that frame of him passed out. Uh, and yeah, it's a sweet moment, but it's also, you know, really, it's really sad as well to see the things he's gone through. But yeah, you know, so there might be the Armored Titan. You've got the Cart Titan, right? Uh, you potentially have the Jaw Titan. Again, like I mentioned, let's see how that plays out. Uh, you potentially have the Female Titan, Right. Um, and then you have uh, a lot of really interesting and important characters kind of bringing their heads together, potentially. So, yeah, there's a lot of that. But like I mentioned, there is that setup, right? The Jaegerists. There is Flock. So the friction is going to be there, right? Uh, it's not as simple as, OK, let's go after Aaron. Let's try to take him down. There is another angle to this. There is another speed bump or stumbling block before any potential retaliation or, you know, taking, da taking down of uh, Aaron Yeager, right? The devil of parody. Because there's no chance in hell that Flock is going to allow them to, you know, have a go at Aaron or go after Aaron, uh, potentially as a big group that kind of comes together, a collective uh, uniting, right? Um, and, you know, uh, before I move on, that was one of the themes of this episode as well. You know, a lot of people kind of uniting and coming together. That division is kind of dissipating almost, right, uh, in favor of unity. Um, and you see that through that phenomenal uh, character arc that concludes for Gabby. Now, let me let me shift the focus to Gabby. Uh, I mean, first of all, I mean, siyama son has, he's pulled it off. He has pulled it off to perfection, right? introducing this new character arc or first of all introducing characters new characters so late in the game but then of course you know having this focus on uh this specific character and the character arc and the parallels to Aaron Jaeger of course and you know uh there's a, again another cool moment as you know she has her Tatakai moment in front of the mirror in front of the sink but yeah you know it's always a risk to introduce a character arc this late in the game but I think asayama san has pulled it off uh this is a phenomenal character arc in such a short uh span of time uh wow uh, most impressive most impressive uh, and, you know, like I mentioned, you know, I'm not going to repeat the things I've said before. I, you know, I've actually tackled the Gabby character arc uh, quite a bit, I think. Um, I, yeah, in detail as well. But yeah, you know, I did get the, essentially I got the, the, 
the climax of it, but this is kind of like a continuation of that, right? And remember how I mentioned in Sneak Attack that I do feel like there is an opportunity here uh, for a climax, right? Uh, beyond the things I saw in that, right? The acceptance was there in Sneak Attack. She had that breakthrough, a major moment. But, you know, I remember saying that, you know, there's a, there's a potential here for an incredible scene with uh, Sasha's family, right? Uh, as a changed individual. Uh, and yup, it happened. It happened. There is an incredible scene. And I remember saying that, you know, the setup is there for her to have a decisive confrontation with the main conflict and it happened. It happened, right? So yeah, you know, that that, that positive change arc uh, just played out to perfection. It really did. It hit all the beats. Um, all, you know, the progression has just been incredible. But yeah, the setup was there. The setup was there for Gabby to come in and save Kaya in that situation, right? And then, of course, you know, they immediately back her, don't they? You know, they immediately um, cover for her. Uh, you know, first of all, Kaya is the first to jump in. Then, of course, Nicolo, both individuals who really had a reason to be upset with um, Gabby. I mean, hell, they wanted to kill her at, so at one point, right? Both of them uh, for the things she did to them, uh, you know, Sasha, killing Sasha essentially. But you know, speaking of Sasha, even this, all this time later, Sasha continues to be, or she continues to make an impact on the lives of some of these characters, right? Her actions kind of live on through eternity essentially, or they live on through uh, these people who love her. And then of course, after that, you know, Mrs. Browse and the other kids jump in uh, to really take the heat off of her back and put the, put the attention on themselves, right? So that was a lovely moment, you know? It really was such a fantastic character arc, right? Uh, the Browse family and um, Sasha, and then of course the connection, or the or Sasha, or the death of Sasha, kind of connecting them to Gabby. Um, but yeah, you know, just uh, it was great to see uh, the redemption, the forgiveness, the love on display by the end of this character arc. There's a really interesting point about you know there being a devil that resides within all of them, right? Uh, that all of them have the capacity to do evil or be evil or do evil things, right? The capacity is there. But again, the key being that you're able to accept it, right? Admitting to it, that is, uh, you know, the first step into potentially getting inner peace, right? Knowing that, you know, the capacity is there. Everyone has that capacity, right? Um, everyone's done some things they regret. Uh, that's for sure. But you know, I've got to say, um, the Gabby character arc has been one of the best of the series. It really has. Uh, and that is really, really impressive given that it was introduced so late in the game. Um, yeah, it really has. I, I thought it, it felt like such a uh, fulfilling uh, conclusion to a character arc. It, you know, it really was quite uh, interesting to see someone emerge from all of this disillusionment, all of this nihilism right? And come out a better person, right? Uh, rise above it, essentially. Um, understand their mistakes, accept their mistakes, rise above it, uh, you know, hope to be a better person, and also accept that, yeah, you know, at one, once upon a time, they, this devil inside certainly facilitated their actions, right? And you see she grabs her arm, you know, the armband, uh, essentially. Um, and it does take us back, you know, it kind of bookends it, doesn't it? Here, at this portion of the character arc and beginning of the character arc, her being this individual who really craved that praise and attention, right, through killing. Um, and, you know, she, that, that, that armband meant a lot to Gabby uh, around the time she's first introduced, right? And it's really great to see that she has, you know, accepted responsibility for her past mistakes and actions, right? And that she's not justifying any of those actions and that she's not convincing herself that she had no other choice. But yeah, I think that might be it for this episode. You know, I'm liking this direction, you know, I'm hoping for more of these episodes or continuation of this uh, focus on the supporting cast. Oh, also, you know, a few things. Uh, let's, you know, let's kind of quickly jump to Zeke and uh, the founder of Ymir. Uh, that whole thing that happened, right? Uh, Aaron Yeager was granted the powers of the founding Titan and he initiated the, the Stampede of the Titans. And of course, he has a new form. His, his founding Titan has a new form, essentially, right? Uh, that has yet to be fully revealed to me. Uh, I can see from a distance, of course, you know, this big, massive rib cage that's kind of like a bird cage on the move. Um, but, and I saw his face, right? <laughs> In that message through uh, the path realm. 
that he kind of addresses all of the subjects of Ymir. You know, there's still there's still a few questions, right? Of course, uh, Zeke, uh, still kind of unknown. And again, another question, you know, I've been talking about, oh, them having these titans uh, potentially on their side, right? Uh, if this whole, like, group kind of comes together, uh, you know, the founder of Ymir makes those titans, right? <laughs> Out of uh, clay or sand in the path realm. So if they are going to become titans again, uh, you know, be it armored titan or the female titan or the jaw titan, uh, the colossal titan or the card titan, once they initiate that transformation, the founder Ymir has to make them. So on that end, there's a lot of questions still, right? Uh, the founder Ymir and Zeke and Aaron, and you know, what exactly needs to happen to free the founder Ymir if she isn't free just yet? Uh, because I do feel like she is going to be creating Titans, the Titan Shifter Titans, right? Because of course, you know, they're going to play a part <laughs> in this, uh, in this end game at some point. So she's going to be creating them. It really was back to the roots, you know, really taking the fans back to some of the early days uh, of Shingeki. Um, yeah, you know, it was great. It really was great. So if you enjoyed that, consider dropping a like, consider dropping some comments, give me your thoughts. If you're into uh, full length, or sorry, if you're interested in full length or perhaps full opacity, consider checking out the Patreon page. And the link for that is in the description and the pinned comment. And also the link for social media, Twitter specifically, is also in the description and the pinned comment. Right then, thank you so much for joining me for this one. And I hope to see you again soon for the next one. So until then, take it easy.